Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, weird history, and for the month of October, spooky history. How, oh, how I have missed you, my delicious little donut. How have you been? Have you been drinking your water? Have you been taking good care of yourself? Have you been going outside to touch some grass? I, I have been, I've been trying because I have been a busy little worker bee getting all things spooky ready for us in the month of October. Over on Instagram, we've got 30 days of spooky history. Sharon is over there managing the history hotline and Shanna is causing all sorts of chaos, spreading her little creepy facts all over the place. We have very, very full content month. Over on Patreon, I have posted some scary stories from around the world for your listening and viewing pleasure. We also have new merch launched with um, our little yokai guys, some ghosties. What else do we have? Uh, Other spooky things. I'll put a picture right here if you're watching on YouTube. (laughs) Needless to say, October is one of my favorite months. And my brother was born on October. Hi, Bubby. I know you're listening to this episode because you love me. Um, His birthday is in October. So I have a fond place in my heart for October. I love October. Anyways, uh, our final little bit of housekeeping is uh, a big thank you. A huge, humongous thank you from the bottom of my mushy, gushy heart. Uh, Like, I... uh, I don't even know what to say other than thank you. Um, The month of September has been the best month for downloads in For the Love of History history. We had 10,000 downloads, which may not sound like a lot for, you know, some podcasts, but for me, for For the Love of History, it is incredible. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Without you, there would be no this. So thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's get to the episode. So to get us started on the spookiest, ookiest of seasons, we'll be talking about something that I once thought only existed as a character on SpongeBob SquarePants or in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Ghost ships. But... I have since learned that they are most certainly real and most certainly spooky. So without further ado, grab your cutlass and a swig of your favorite pirate-related non-alcoholic beverage. If that's what you're into, that's fine too. And let's get to it. If you have listened to the birthday special from like two years ago, the one with my mom, you may have heard that my history interest began after finding out that yes, indeed, pirates are a part of history. My dad is a huge pirate enthusiast and has all sorts of pirate books, many a pirate poster in the garage, and a few t-shirts from the Blackbeard Festival that was held in Virginia when we used to live there. I have some very fond and not so fond memories of washing and waxing my dad's truck with him for some forced father-daughter fun time. (laughs) Staring at the pirate flag poster on the garage that explained the different meanings of the different Jolly Rogers was one of my absolute favorite things to do while we waited for the wax to dry on the car. And my dad would quiz me on the meanings of each symbol, and I got very good at this game. I will try to find a picture of that poster and, and put it up here for the, um, the YouTube version of the episode. I also remember the SpongeBob SquarePants episode that had the Flying Dutchman in it, and I ran to my dad and asked him if it was real, and in a very my dad way, he made me look it up instead of telling me about it. I had to look it up on our family computer, and after many a question, you remember Ash Jeeves, right? That that search engine, it was like pre-Google. I loved that love that man. Anyways, I found out that the Flying Dutchman was real, kind of. That day, I learned the difference between a ghost ship and a phantom ship. Ghost ships are real ships that were abandoned by their crew and passengers for one reason or another, and they float freely for a few days, a few weeks, a few months, or even a few decades. 
Sometimes the cause of the abandonment is obvious, and other times they have a supernatural tinge. Phantom ships, on the other hand, are either stories about real ships that have been spookified or are simply legendary ships of ambiguous, fantastical origin. They are firmly in the realm of fantasy. Today we are going to talk about both because they are equally as cool and we can do whatever we want on here. So we'll start out today with the real and the very spooky ghost ships. Ships get abandoned way more than I thought. Like I, I knew it happened from time to time, but I thought just because you know, they're very expensive. They're very big. You know, the big boats wouldn't get abandoned all the time. Maybe it was like little dinghies, little boats, little tiny ones. But nay, nay, dear one, big old giant ships and sometimes cruise ships and those like container ships get abandoned and left to drift at sea all the time. And according to the IMO, the International Marine Organization database, there are 400 and 38, 438 abandoned ships sailing the sea, or maybe they like, you know, sunk and now they're at the bottom, but we don't know because they're lost worldwide, 438 worldwide, which is an outrageous number to me. Like I know the ocean is big, but 438 ships, wild. Anyways, ships like the Octavia have a very clear beginning and end. In 1761, the schooner, which is a type of ship that has like two mast poles and two square sails and like a bunch of little triangle sails, they're not like big pirate ships. Like when you think of a pirate ship, not that the Octavia was a pirate ship, but that's my reference point is pirate ships. So not the like the real big pirate ships, but like the medium sized pirate ships is what they look like. It's a schooner. Anyways, there's a picture here. I digress. The Octavius had made a very successful voyage from London to China, and after loading their cargo and taking on supplies, they pulled out of port and headed back to London. They had a full crew, and the captain had even brought along his wife and their little son for some good old family time. It was a very safe passage, and boats did it all the time. Well, relatively safe. The ocean, she's scary. So... This whole family and their crew were going sailing back from China to London. The sailing must have been picturesque. The weather as good as any sailor could hope for, which boosted the captain's confidence, apparently enough to try something, the Northwest Passage. The Northwest Passage is kind of a no-no because it has extremely harsh weather, real thick ice, and then shallow waters that just like randomly appear. So it's not the best place to sail, and it hadn't been sailed successfully at this time. This mistake would actually cost the captain, his family, and the entire crew their lives. The ship never made it back to port in London, and it was assumed to be lost at sea, sunk at the bottom, never to be seen again. But on October 11th, this is like a few days ago, if you're listening to this when the episode comes out, on October 11th, 1775, nearly 15 years after the Octavius was lost, the crew of the ship Herald found the ship Octavia. It had been 15 years, so they assumed that it was abandoned, but uh, when they entered the hull of the ship, they found something horrifying. The entire crew of 28 men was frozen in their cots. And when they entered the captain's quarters, they found him frozen at his desk with the logbook open to the very last entry and a pen in his hand. And it looked like he was just pausing in thought, waiting to write something else down. This was all too much for the crew. And they panicked and they wrenched the logbook out of the captain's hand and fled back to their ship. After reading the book, they discovered the truth. The Northern Strait had been far too perilous. They became stuck in the ice and the entire crew was trapped there. There was no way to get on land, nowhere to go once you got off the ship. They were stuck. 
It was like a prison. After this sighting, the Octavius was never seen again, and it's been like more than a hundred years, so I assume it's somewhere at the bottom of the ocean. Other ships have claimed their ghost ship status, not for the length of their abandonment, but for the circumstances of it. Probably one of the most famous real-life ghost ships is the Mary Celeste. It started its journey on November 7th, 1872 with a crew of seven men, the captain and his wife and their young two-year-old daughter. Side note, the ocean is so scary. Like, wildly terrifying. While I was researching ghost ships, I hopped into this, like, weird rabbit hole side tangent of spontaneous storms on the sea and something called rogue waves, which, uh, friend, let me tell you, nightmare fuel. Nightmare fuel. There are these waves that can be like thousands of kilometers long, so it's like a wall, just like a wall of wave, and some of them can be 30 meters high, which is like, it's like a skyscraper is coming at you. Just, but the ocean, ah, terrifying. So the fact that anybody just has the guts to go out on the water, amazing. The utmost respect for those people, but I digress. So the Mary Celeste was all packed up, ready to go from New York to their final destination in Italy. They had plenty of food, the ship was in ship shape, everything was fine. The crew was a little scant, but you know, it was fine. They've made this journey several times, dozens of times before. But sometime between November 7th and November 17th, something happened. On November 17th, another ship called the De Gratia spotted the ship around the Azos Islands which was really weird because the Mary Celeste was supposed to have already reached its destination in Italy. When the crew of the De Gratia board the Mary Celeste, they found it completely abandoned. They immediately began looking for any sign of why the crew, captain, and his family had seemingly vanished. The sails were fine, the ship itself was fine, except for a little bit of water that it had taken on. There, you know, were six months worth of perfectly good food on the ship. The cargo was still all intact, none of it was missing, but the single lifeboat that the Mary Celeste had was gone, as well as a few navigation tools. Except for that, you would have thought that the Mary Celeste crew, captain, and family had simply vanished into thin air. As the crew of the De Gratia was trying to find any clues, they stumbled across the logbook open to its last entry page, which had no indication of any struggles, any problems, no bad weather. Every entry in the logbook was completely normal. Nothing out of the ordinary. Without really finding any answers, the crew of the De Gratia sailed the ship another 800 miles to Gibraltar to have a salvage hearing. So when ships were abandoned and another crew found them, they would usually take it to like the nearest port with like authorities and stuff to have a salvage hearing. It was like basically a hearing to determine legal finders keepers and to see if the crew of the De Gratia was entitled to any kind of reward from the insurance money the Mary Celeste had because ships had insurance, which is wild. That's so cool. I had no idea. Anyways, because of the mysterious circumstances in which the Mary Celeste was found by the De Gratia, the British Vice Admiral, Ad- <laughs> oh my gosh, the British Vice Admiralty, that is a hard word to say, Admiralty Court thought that things were a little bit sus and didn't entirely believe that there had been no sketchy business afoot. And in the end, although proven innocent, the Degbratia crew was awarded only one-sixth of the salvage price was 
which was like unheard of apparently. But what's worse is that the captain, the crew, and his family from the Mary Celeste were never seen again. The story of the Mary Celeste was retold and told again hundreds of times in books, movies, documentaries, and each one had their own theories about what happened to the crew the captain and his family. Some blamed sea monsters, others blamed God. Some even suspected that the De Grazia and the Mary Celeste were in cahoots for insurance fraud. For years, it remained a mystery until a group of maritime historians, scientists, and marine archaeologists got together in 2007 to finally put the case to rest. And they made a whole documentary about it that you can watch online. It's called The True Story of the Mary Celeste. And I'll let you watch that to figure out if they figured out what really happened. The Octavius and the Mary Celeste are just two tiny fractions of the ghost ship fleet. Hundreds of others have sailed the seven seas and their stories are out there waiting to be discovered. It wouldn't be a very good spooky episode if we didn't dabble in the more mystical side of ghost ship history. To end our episode today, dear one, I'm going to tell you the tale of one of the most legendary phantom ships in the world. Can you guess? Can you guess what it is? I'll give you a, a, a three count. One, two, th the Flying Dutchman. How did you? Oh my God, you're so smart. You're right. It's the Flying Dutchman. Yes. It's one of the most famous phantom ships in the Western world. Okay. And we're going to talk about it. So you'd be hard pressed to find people more suspicious. Nope. Superstitious. <laughs> Sounds like I'm dissing sailors. Sailors are very sus. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. Superstitious. <laughs> Oh, what with rogue waves and random ass storms popping up in scary creatures that call the ocean home, it's no surprise that they are a very superstitious people. If I made my livelihood at the whim of the sea, I would probably be hella stitious too. According to legend and superstition, spotting the flying Dutchman is the worst omen you could possibly get. And like most good stories, there is a grain of truth in the mythology of the Flying Dutchman. There really was a ship captained by a man named Hendrik von der Decken, that's a, that's a mouthful of a name, who was nicknamed the Dutchman because, and you guessed it, he was Dutch. The creativity off the charts. Anyways, unfortunately in 1641, the ship sank in a storm, but sailor after sailor reported seeing it and then some tragedy would befall the entire crew or the poor unfortunate soul who saw it first. So how did the Flying Dutchman become the Flying Dutchman? What's the, what is the origin story behind it? So there's several versions of the story. One involves a good old fashioned love triangle. On the Dutchman's last voyage, there was a young couple headed to seek their fortune in other lands, and the good old Captain Hendrick went full garbage human and fell in lust with the young girl and dispatched the young man so the captain could have her all to himself, which congratulations, Captain Hendrick, you are the possible first garbage human of the season, but this is a legend, so we'll just, honorary garbage human? Sure, honorary, gar tentative garbage human. We don't know all the facts, okay? Anyways. <laughs> After the death of her loved one, the girl was understandably distraught, and the next day she mysteriously disappeared. And soon after, an incredibly violent storm rocked the ship. The crew, begged Captain Hendrick to find shelter somewhere, anywhere, but he refused, saying he will sail the sea forever if he must. And when the words left his mouth, a great voice bellowed from the depths of the sea saying, so be it. And the ship was never able to take port again and was doomed to sail 
for eternity. Another tale says the ship found itself in a great storm for days and days, calling upon God for help over and over again, but God apparently ignored their pleas. And finally, Captain Hendrick cursed God and called upon the devil to make a deal, his soul for the storm to stop. The devil heard and agreed, but as the devil is wont to do, he tricked Hendrick into giving him much more than just his soul, and his entire crew became cursed. They were never able to die, but never able to really live, for they were no longer allowed on land, and God did not want them in heaven. So the sea being the neutral ground was the only place they could ever be. And finally, this one hits a little, a little close to home, if you ask me. According to legend, the crew was ravaged by a deadly plague and they were denied entry to every port they came across because of this. The sailors were dying one by one, and their tormented souls were also not allowed entry into heaven for some reason. So they stayed on the ship forever sailing and never resting. And it's very much giving early 2020 cruise ships, if you know what I mean, not being able to dock at different places. And I will never I will never, I will never, you couldn't pay me enough money to go on a cruise. Number one, the ocean. Once again, far too scary. And number two, cruises, the bacteria. I'm sorry if you love cruises. I love that for you, but not for me. I can't. I absolutely cannot. All you can eat buffets freak me out. So there's no way, no way I could do a cruise. Anyways, (laughs) I will digress. No more talking about cruises. Anyways. (laughs) People have been reporting seeing the Flying Dutchman for hundreds of years. And one of the most famous Flying Dutchman sightings involves royalty. Prince George, who would later become King George V, a.k.a. Queen Elizabeth's dad. What? I know. Three degrees of separation. Yeah, so he was <laughs> he was sailing with a crew off the coast of Australia when one of the lookouts spotted a glowing red light. I'll have you know that in SpongeBob, it's a green light, but it's fine. Okay? Anyways. <laughs> Inside the light was apparently a ship that seemed to be floating above the ocean. 13 people, including Georges himself, reported seeing the light. Their ship sailed closer and closer to investigate, and the light got bigger and bigger, and then suddenly it disappeared. It vanished into thin air, and the crew was convinced that it was the Flying Dutchman, and their suspicions were amplified because not long after, tragedy struck the crew. Just shortly after the, air quotes, sighting of the Flying Dutchman, the first man who spotted the light fell from the top of the lookout and joined Davy Jones in his locker at the bottom of the sea. Flying Dutchman spottings continued long after the age of sailing on into World War II, and there are even many modern spottings today. The Flying Dutchman has solidly become a cult classic with dozens of Flying Dutchman remakes and adaptations with my two favorite being the SpongeBob SquarePants one and the Pirates of the Caribbean one. If you, it's 2023. If you haven't seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Stop listening to this podcast or watching it and go watch them because they're so good. The flying, the depiction, the artistic interpretation of the Flying Dutchman and its crew is so flicka flacking cool. 
in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie because they're like they they turn into the sea. They're they're turning into sea creatures because they've been at sea for so long. It's beautiful. It's perfection. I have no notes. It's amazing. If I was going to be an undead creature sailing the seven seas for an eternity, I would want to be on the Flying Dutchman slowly turning into my favorite sea creature. I I would be a lobster. I think I would be a lobster. That's what I would choose. No. Yes. I think I would be a lobster. Lobsters are cool. <laughs> Lobsters are super cool. Or... Or an orca. Ooh, I'd be an orca. <gasps> Were there any orcas on the Pirates of the Caribbean ship? I don't think so. I would be the first one. That would be great. What would you choose? <laughs> Anyways, a big digression right now. <laughs> so back on track. The Flying Dutchman isn't the only phantom ship that's out there, however. There are hundreds of other stories of other cursed captains and crews from all over the world. But for today, dear one, that will be the end of our story. And I will leave you with some advice from Tia Dalma from Pirates of the Caribbean 3. Take the jar of dirt with you just in case you have the misfortune of running into the Flying Dutchman. Well, dear one, we are at our final thought today. And when I tell you what I'm about to tell you, you better hold on to your flabbers because they will be gasted, okay? Gasted like no other. I let out an audible gasp when I found out this information. So here it goes, okay? So the desk inside the U.S. President's office, the Oval Office, is called the Resolute Desk, right? Okay. It's a very ornately carved, super-duper old desk made in 1880 and gifted to President Rutherford, nope, Rutherford B. Hayes by Queen Victoria. Normal, cool, whatever, right? World leaders give each other weird ass gifts all the time. Why not? An ornately decorated desk makes sense. Nothing outrageous here, TK. Except, except friend, there's more. The desk is made from ghost ship wood. (gasps) What? I know. Okay, so it's made from a ship, a ghost ship, called HMS Resolute, hence the Resolute Desk, right? It got stuck in some ice. The HMS Resolute got stuck in some ice while out on a mission in seven, nope, in 1873. When the crew abandoned the ship, everyone was pretty much okay. They left the ship in the ice, right? It floated around for two years on its own and was found 12,000 miles from where it had been abandoned. And you know what is even more wild? There's more ghost ship furniture out there. There's more HMS Resolute ghost ship furniture. Oh my God, I'm banging on my mic because I'm so excited. There's more furniture out there made from the HMS Resolute. Queen Victoria had the ship decommissioned, right? It couldn't sail anymore, whatever. But the wood was still good, so she had the wood from the Resolute salvaged. Then, then she hosted a furniture-making competition. A competition to see who could make the best thing from the reclaimed wood for a White House gift. What the heck? What in the weird-ass wonderful world do we live in? This is amazing. So this desk won the competition, then made its happy little way. This ship, this desk made from ship went on to a ship and sailed from England to the United States and was put in the president's office. Go ship wood desk. Amazing. Fantastic. I love the world. I love the world. Well, dear one, that is the first episode of season seven in the books. I am 
so excited to bring you more spooky history this month and all the world history, women's history, and weird history to come this season. We've got amazing guests, some fantastic and infuriating topics in store. Don't forget to share this episode with other history BFFs and leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can head on over to Patreon where we have lots of fun bonus content like spooky history told in the dark, sleepy history, bonus episodes, early releases, and merch discounts, which is so much fun. And when I have time, book updates with with the book I'm, I'm trying to write which is very exciting. And speaking of merch, don't forget to check out all of the new and classic For the Love of History merch available out right now. Your support means the absolute world to me. And oh, P.S. and by the way, uh, we reached the 100 reviews on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Boop, boop, we did it. It took three years, but we did it, which is really exciting. And with that bit of good news, I will bid you adieu, but not before I remind you to do something that makes you happy, Take good care of yourself. Drink your water, you dehydrated ray of sunshine. And I will see you next week when we talk about the cursed kimono and other spooky tales from Japan. Oh, okay. Love you. Bye. We did it. We did it. It took us an hour, but we did it. ASMR. Do. <laughs> Is that a bug? Is there a bug in here? His father, how's father, how's father? Wanna be here now? You know what I always wondered? How do those mukbang people get their audio quality so good? <laughs> if I could get in contact with some of those mukbang people, that'd be great. I don't wanna wait for our lives to be over. One more sip of water. Wow, wuffy. Wubby, why are you so cute over there? One drink for hydration. One drink for caffeine. And one drink for fun. That's called the ADHD drink trifecta. This is the wrong script. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Sucking at something's the first step of being sorta of good at something. Sucking's the first step at being sorta of good. That's okay. It's okay if we mess up. You can see the window light and the ring light right there, but that's fine. Nobody's gonna die. <laughs>